Bonjour, you're on France 24. A warm welcome to all our viewers on cable, satellite and ADSL. As of this very moment, you're nearly 250 million to get France 24 in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, New York and Washington, D.C. Coming up in, our, in this edition, following a stinging report that suggests a pullout from Iraq, British Prime Minister Tony Blair is at the White House. He's announced an upcoming trip to the Middle East as President Bush ponders his next move. More twists and turns in the case of a murdered ex-Russian spy that on the day that Alexander Litvinenko was buried in London. And Cyprus rejects Turkey's compromise office to kickstart Ankara's EU candidacy bid. But first, we go to Lebanon, where the leader of the hardline pro-Syrian Hezbollah movement is speaking live. Hassan Nasrallah has vowed that the opposition will not surrender in its mass protest to bring down the Western-backed government. His speech being broadcast live on two giant screens outside government offices in Beirut. Demonstrators there are camping out for the seventh day, rejecting a fresh call to return to the bargaining table from Prime Minister Fuad Senora. Later in this edition, we'll go live to Beirut and our correspondent. It's bad in Iraq. Those are the words from the mouth of U.S. President George Bush at a White House press conference with British Prime Minister Tony Blair. One day after the bipartisan Iraq study group recommended an about-face in Iraq, Bush admitted that the situation in Iraq was grave and deteriorating while offering a measured response to the recommendation that most U.S. combat troops would only be able to leave Iraq by early 2008. Shoulder to shoulder, five years after 9-11 and after two invasions, George Bush and Tony Blair believe in the power of a united front, even if the message isn't wholly positive, especially about Iraq. I, I believe we need a new approach, and that's why I've tasked the Pentagon to analyze the way forward. You could call it a big turnaround for George Bush, but he was just echoing what his defense secretary said this week and what critics of the war have said for a long time. And if it is a turnaround, it doesn't extend to the president considering the possibility of failure. I like to remind people it's akin to the Cold War in many ways. There's an ideological clash going on. And the question is, will we have the resolve and the confidence in liberty uh, to prevail. That's really the fundamental question facing, it's not going to face this government or this government because we made up our mind. <laughs> it's a noble mission and it's the right mission and it's important for our world that it succeeds and so the question is how do we make sure that it does indeed succeed. The next step in the mission for Blair will be a visit to the Middle East where he will meet both Palestinians and Israelis. He says peace in the region is critical to peace in Iraq and he insists to the peace of the world. Let's go live now to correspondent Ed O'Keefe in Washington. Ed, is, is George Bush changing his tack? It doesn't sound like it. The president today was saying again that if Iran and Syria are going to be talked to directly, they have to be willing to help stop the violence. They need to end a nuclear program in Iran. That's really not different than what he's been saying recently. It just seems that he's adapting the recommendations of the group to his talking points. Now, Bush got a little hot under the collar after one reporter's question. He did. Uh, he doesn't do that too often, and when he does, it's a sure sign that he's upset. It was a question from a British reporter uh, r whether or not he uh, understands the significance of the war and the impact it's having, and he got very upset um, at one point, um, sort of beginning to lecture that reporter. It's a sign that he indeed was upset, and I think it helps the president. It helps him uh, with skeptics here in the United States and around the world, because he was saying, you know, I talk to these military families. I understand the threat that we face. I mean, yeah, a British reporter for that other network across the English Channel from you, Francois, gets to go home boasting that he pissed off the president of the United States. But I think President Bush actually benefited from the question because it shows he's in touch and he cares. Just briefly, uh, Ed, how is Tony Blair faring in all of this? You know, I think he came to the table today with uh, more poker chips in his, in his pocket because a lot of what he's been talking about recently was recommended by the group. He wants direct talks with Iran. Well, the Iraq study group says, let's talk directly with Iran. He also says that the United States should be more engaged in the Middle East. Sure enough, the Iraq study group says, engage yourself more with the Middle East. So I think Tony Blair walks away in good shape. Thank you very much, Ed O'Keefe in Washington. Let's go back now, though, to our top story that we were mentioning at the top of this bulletin. Lebanon, day seven of mass anti-government protests. The head of Hezbollah currently speaking in a live televised speech. Let's go over to Beirut and our correspondent, Sophie Claudet. Sophie, what's the latest? 
For the later, since uh, Hassan Atwal has been speaking now for over an hour um, um, in front of a galvanized crowd of hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, downtown Beirut is filled up with supporters of the opposition, whether they be Hezbollah or Amal, the Tushia movement, the two Christians as well. Uh, he's been insisting on the fact that the opposition would not back down. He's vowed more protests, more sit-ins over the weekend, a big prayer on Friday, a huge rally on Sunday. So basically, the opposition is not backing down. He's, he's delivered a very strong message against any incitement and the idea that Hezbollah and the opposition would never take its weapon, never brandish its weapon against anybody who's Lebanese. He, he made it very clear there would never be a civil war in Lebanon on his account, on the account of the opposition, saying that Hezbollah's weapon were only to be brandished against Israel. Um, one last very important point, he's been extremely critical of the, of the Bush administration saying that any interference by Bush, by the French government, was refused and that the, the negotiation had to happen amongst Lebanese for the good of Lebanon. All right, Sophie Claudet, thank you very much. Keep us posted in our upcoming editions for further developments out of Lebanon. We move now on to the case of the poisoned ex-Russian spy Alexander Litvidenko. One of the contacts he met is now in hospital. It was earlier reported he was in critical condition. That's been denied. But Russian businessman Dmitry Kodvun has developed symptoms of radiation poisoning after meeting Litvinenko in London. London, where loved ones paid an emotional farewell today to Litvinenko himself. Two weeks after the shock death of former Russian spy, friends and family gathered to attend a memorial service at a London mosque. Litvinenko's father arrived with Ahmed Zakiev, a leading Chechen who has been granted asylum in Britain. Anger at the death of the ex-agent has not subsided. He was murdered by Russian agents, which is, in a sense, unprecedented in the history of this country. A British citizen was brutally and cowardly murdered on British soil by agents of foreign power. I wonder what your government is going to do now. The ex-KGB agent had requested a Muslim ceremony before he died on November 23rd, three weeks after falling ill with a mysterious condition. Doctors subsequently diagnosed poisoning by a radioactive isotope, polonium-210. The funeral, delayed pending the post-mortem on Litvinenko's body, came as Russian police followed their British counterparts in reclassifying the probe into his death as a murder inquiry. A black hearse, topped with white wreaths, led a funeral procession of about 10 cars to Highgate Cemetery in North London for a non-religious burial. We'll stay with London to tell you that the British capital has been hit by a tornado. No serious injuries reported, but winds of more than 130 kilometers an hour have ripped roofs off homes and tore down walls in the residential Kensal Rise area in the northwest of London. Tornadoes of Britain normally weak and rarely cause damage. Nicosia is balking, but the European Union is seriously considering Turkey's offer to open one port and one airport to traffic from Cyprus. That's in a bid to stave off the partial freezing of EU candidacy talks with Ankara, that over its refusal to recognize the government in Nicosia. Ankara's position is now official and comforts the hopes of the European Commission. One condition, though, that Once Turkey again, respect all of its good commitments. And if this gets confirmed, it will evidently be a very important step towards the total implementation of the Ankara Protocol. And for this, I salute the step taken by the Turkish government. Turkey has always refused commercial exchanges with the Greek Cypriots, despite committing to free trade with all EU members in the 2005 Ankara Protocol. Today it seems ready to open its port and an airport to Greek Cypriots for a year. In exchange for this, Turkey's demands are simple. It wishes to continue its accession negotiations with the EU and hopes Europe finds political solutions for the reunification of Cyprus. The EU had put strong pressure on Turkey to make a show of goodwill. Last week, it considered a partial suspension in Turkey's accession negotiations. Today, the Finnish presidency of the EU salutes Turkey's constructive gesture, but the Republic of Cyprus has officially rejected Ankara's offer. Here in Paris, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak and French President Jacques Chirac are to inaugurate a major exhibit. Egypt's Sunken Treasures opens Friday at the Grand Palais Museum. Many of the treasures had indeed been buried and forgotten in an area where the sea and the Nile Delta had taken over due to erosion. That's it for this edition. Much more news coming up and stay with us here. Welcome again to France 24.
Hello and welcome to the latest international forecast on France 24. The west of Europe will continue to be hit by inclemency with 10 degrees in London and Paris. It will rain from Switzerland to Italy with a little sunshine breaking through in Rome at 16 degrees. Further east, mild with clear skies and 13 degrees in Budapest. Also mild up to 6 degrees in Minsk. The lower half of the African continent will experience frequent rain, however South Africa will escape with only light sprinkles and 22 degrees in Cape Town. Across to the Congo and Angola, storms may be intense with 28 degrees in Kinshasa, but as we continue further northwest, conditions will brighten up to 31 degrees in Porto Novo. The weather will worsen across the North African coast as an unstable current arrives in the Mediterranean basin. It will be 16 degrees in Algiers. In the Middle East, precipitous weather may develop from the Persian Gulf to the center of Saudi Arabia. Clouds will gather over Doha with 22 degrees. Further northwest, low pressure may cause showers and possible storms over the coasts of Turkey, Libya and Egypt. However, it will remain clear from Beirut to Tel Aviv with 21 degrees. Conditions will vary across Asia with dry weather over India, West China and Eastern Russia, but showers, storms and snow in many other regions. 3 degrees in Alma Atta, that will climb further south to 20 degrees in New Delhi. Intense rain may fall between the Bay of Bengal and Malaysia, but further east it will be sunny and fine with 23 degrees in Hong Kong. Up to China, chilly and minus 2 degrees in Beijing. Stormy weather will again develop in the tropical north of Australia, especially over northeast Queensland. In New Zealand, the persistent rain will start to calm with 17 degrees in Auckland. As usual, conditions will vary between Indonesia and Polynesia, mild and sunny with 26 degrees in Numia. 27 degrees in the rain over Cairns, across to the west, dry and 22 degrees in Perth. Stay with us for the next forecast in 30 minutes on France 24.